So we're going to continue our discussion about experiments and reading a paper by looking at a few more examples of different kinds of methods that are used. And like I said in the last video, one of the critically important things to keep track of when you're thinking about experiments is to distinguish between the manipulations, that is what you as a scientist are doing, versus the measurements, that is, the outputs that you are um, measuring in your experiment. In order to discuss these, I want to discuss a few general um, experiments and then some specific examples. A couple of different kinds of manipulations that you might do to provide a particular sensory experience to an animal or a person, or to train an animal or a person to uh, learn a new behavior. So in that case, what you're doing as the experimenter is either providing the sensory stimulation or working the person or the animal through a training paradigm. In doing this, sometimes you would couple this with a behavioral output. So maybe your manipulation is to train an animal to do a particular behavior, and then your measurement is to see how long it takes them to learn that behavior. When we're dealing with humans, if we want to get a non-invasive way to record what's going on in their brains, then we need to use functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. In addition to this, um, you can provide, you can, as a measurement, look at the electrical activity of one or more neurons in a living animal. And for the first example that I wanted to talk about combines altering sensory experience as the manipulation with electrical recording of one or more neurons as the, um, as the measurement. And that comes from this paper here, which is one of the papers that we're doing in our class right now, um, in which uh, they alter sensory experiences and provide a variety of different sensory experiences to the animal while electrically recording from neurons in the animal's somatosensory cortex, or touch region of its brain. Notice that altered sensory experience or trained behavior is a manipulation does not mean that you're always going to be using behavioral output as a measurement. In this case, they're combining a behavioral organismal level uh, manipulation, changing sensory experience, with an electrical recording of, some, of one or more neurons in the animal as the measurement. In addition to this, you can also, either in living animals or in isolated brain chunks, electrically stimulate one or more neurons and then look to see what, that, what output that has. Sometimes you might electrically stimulate a few neurons in a living animal and look and see what the behavioral consequences of that are. Other times you might electrically stimulate the neurons in one region of the animal and record the way that affects activity in another. All right, we'll come back to optogenetic stimulation in a minute, but just like you can electrically stimulate in isolated brain chunks, you can also record in isolated brain chunks. And in fact, in this experiment, there's a, um, which we didn't go into in great detail, but is available on Blackboard, um, there's a series of manipulations. So first of all, they provide a week of altered um, experience for the animal. So that corresponds to a change in sensory experience for some animals but not others that happens over a period of a week. Then during their experimental time they isolate brain chunks from that animal and electrically stimulate one set of neurons while electrically recording from another set of neurons. Um, and so sometimes you can be coupling multiple manipulations, um, a long-term sensory manipulation with an immediate electrical stimulation and then looking at the consequences um, in terms of activity in connected neurons. Another um, topic that we've talked a little bit under, uh, already in this class is optogenetics. Um, and so op optogenetics uh, allows you to either activate with channel rhodopsin or inhibit with something called halorhodopsin the um, activity of particular sets of neurons. Usually it's done in living animals, but it also can be done in isolated brain chunks. And in fact, we have examples of each of those here. So one is, uh, is this paper here that, um, that we talked 
that we're going to talk a little bit about in class, um, which is uh, that they first actually, um, in some animals, leave the animals alone, and in other animals, put a toxin in that creates Parkinson's-like symptoms. But then the, um, the, the immediate measurements that they're doing is um, stimulating either cell type A or cell type B in the brain, and then looking for a behavioral output. So in this case, um, there's actually a toxin delivered to some animals first, which we'll talk about again in another minute, um, but the immediate um, manipulation is optogenetic stimulation, and the output that we're looking for is movement, which is a behavioral level output. Alternatively, um, this paper here, which is another one that Teresa and I discussed on Blackboard, um, uses isolated brain chunks or whole brains, um, and in, again, they're using optogenetics as the manipulation, but now instead of recording behaviorally, the recording is from um, electrical recording from neurons. So you can combine optogenetic stimulation with electrical recording, for example. As I mentioned before, sometimes you use uh, chemical drug delivery. For example, in this paper here, we discuss how a chemical was used to eliminate uh, some dopamine producing neurons and create Parkinson's like symptoms before they began their optogenetic manipulation and final behavioral output. There are other ways to more precisely deliver drugs as well. This paper here takes advantage of some very particular way of delivering glutamate, which is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Here what they do is they have a chemically contained glutamate that is inert because it is surrounded by what's called a chemical cage on it. And then they have a laser that they can use to uncage or release the glutamate. The consequence of that is that any cell whose cell body happens to be close to the site of their laser will start, will fire a few action potentials. This then in turn can be coupled with electrical recordings. So now what we are doing is a drug delivery or a chemical delivery, in this case the chemical glutamate, is being delivered into isolated chunks of brain, not washed on the whole chunk of brain, but in very, very precise micrometer uh, resolution with the laser. We're releasing glutamate. And then what we're going to do is not record from this neuron that's being stimulated, but record from its neighbors. And so we record from one of the neighboring neurons and say, where does it get input from? So, for example, I might record from a neuron who lives in layer two, three here, and find that most of the time when I release glutamate in layer four, thus activating layer four neurons to fire action potentials, I get excitatory inputs onto this layer two, three neuron from which I'm recording. You can also use chemistry as an output measurement. So for example, measuring the levels of neurotransmitters or hormones, um, which is not one of the examples that we're gonna talk about right now, but is a common thing that neurophysiologists and neuroscientists do. One other thing that you can do to an organism is manipulate it genetically. So for example, in this paper here, um, what the, the experimenters did was to genetically alter some animals, and then the output reading that they're looking at is a behavioral output. Um, in addition to this, um, sometimes you just look for natural variability within a group. Um, so for example, maybe some mice are naturally better at learning a, a task than others, and so we would um, uh, distinguish between the good learners and the bad learners and see what's different in their brains, or something uh, akin to that in humans as well. Um, or sometimes you're just curious to know in a normal healthy brain um, where some protein might be located or what's the sort of like baseline function in a normal healthy brain. So without any uh, significant manipulation, maybe you're just curious to know where a particular protein is. In that case, you might use antibodies that are designed to identify what proteins are present or where those proteins are in a sample. And that is um, one of the um, major um, measurements that is used in this study. And in fact, there's in this study um, not a significant number of different 
groups per se that we're looking at. We're just comparing one brain region to another to see what um, where these uh, types of receptors are, but the behavior isn't directly measured in this study. Rather, it's just um, uh, hypothesized based on other work. Um, one last note is that this is by no means an exhaustive list, um, but the main points that I wanted to, to convey here are the variety of different um, manipulations you can perform as an experimenter, the variety of different measurements that you might use in order to assess what's going on, and the fact that you can mix and match these things at different levels. So for example, we can have optogenetic stimulation with the behavioral measurement or sensory experience alterations and then electrical stimulation and isolated brain chunks to determine something about what's going on at a synaptic level. Um, and so uh, there are a variety of different levels at which you can probe a system and a variety of different levels at which you can measure the consequences of the way you've poked and prodded at that system.